Okay, I apologize for the late start on, um, on today's presentation, but I want to start out by giving, we all need to give ourselves a round of applause because this is our final advisory meeting. Yay! We have, it's, it is kind of sad, and I, it is, but even though we're starting late, we are ending on time. Oh yeah, we're doing a kiss the brains and the, the choo-choos and the sparkles. Yes, because we have done um, an outstanding job as an advisory committee. I think we are, if I can say so, I think we are the exemplar for future advisory committees um, in the system. And so I want to thank each of you for your dedication your hard work, and so y'all are trying to go to the back page to look at the answers. Um, but I'm gonna get y'all out of here because it is the season premiere of Scandal, and so Angela must be in front of her TV at nine o'clock because I need to find out what happens to Miss Olivia Pope. Um, she's on the beach. Um, so, um, but before that, I, I do wanna thank you for your hard work, your dedication, the time that you've invested, um, the energy, the comments, the phone calls. I could not have done this without you, and I want to thank you um, from the bottom of my heart. We'll have a more celebratory time, but tonight we actually have to really work. Um, and I want to invite you, so the superintendent is looking forward to us coming to meet her on Monday. That is open to the committee. I want y'all there, 6 o'clock on Monday. What? Everybody's like, remember? Uh, didn't we talk about this? This Monday? Yeah. Why not? We need to present. If we, don't, if we get to consensus or it, it seemed like there was the strong direction based off of what you submitted, but um, to present all the information that we heard over the last six to eight weeks. So um, Monday at six o'clock, she's available. If you guys have availability, because I think I asked this question, if you had availability during the day versus at night, and most people said at night, but it's only for one hour. It's from six to seven in the superintendent's conference room to present the recommendations. It's upstairs on eight. And so um, I would like for her to meet all of you. I would like for you all to be in the room um, because this, like I said, we have to we have to present something, and I would like for her to hear it um, from you because you guys have been a part of the the work. Um, so did I get, was that a miscommunication? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. I will. Right now, it's um, do it, do many of you know if you are available from six to seven? Okay. Six thirty, you could come. The reason why it's the only day is because this becomes public. I mean, not to say it's not public now, because it is. We publish everything. But it becomes a part of the board um, process next Thursday and Friday, which is why we need to make sure we, you know, we're where we're supposed to be and where we're trying to go and all that. Um, so that means that it becomes, it re becomes reviewed next week and then it goes public on Friday. Yeah. So Monday is kind of like our only option. Where we can have time to kind of explain behind some of the, okay. I will do it in a little case because I'm the only one that's sitting there. You won't be the only one. I saw several hands around the table, right? Yeah, okay. Awesome. Um, six to seven. Yeah, just come upstairs and I'll give a list to the guard and you guys just come through the security guard and ask to come and see the superintendent. Um, okay, so I, the, many of this, many of the items that you are seeing, um, I'm gonna go through kind of what is the, the, the PowerPoint presentation that includes the content, that it also includes the whole body of information. Um, 
So here's the table of contents. You saw this last week. Um, it opens up with the law. And then it probably needs to have a slide in here that actually outlines the options. I'll make sure that that's included because it just outlines the options up front. Then it's supposed to highlight the data analysis and strategic plan. So slide uh, page three, page three, um, top of the slide, you guys have seen that before. It's, no, it's not new. It came from our, I think our first meeting. Slide, the bottom of slide three is um, also not new. You've seen that one before. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, so that would be slide six on page four, on page three. Slide, page four, in terms of predictors of dropouts, I know I've, I thought I used this during the workshop, but I can't remember if this was shown here with this advisory, and I can't remember. Yes? Yes, thank you. Okay. And then also the bottom of eight, I know that you've seen slide eight as well. Page eight. Slide five, or page five, slides nine and 10, you've seen those slides, those are not new. The same with page six, uh, slides 11 and 12, those are not new as well. However, slide seven, page seven, uh, slide 13 with the PTA, you all asked for this information and here is the information regarding the number of active or current local school councils um, as well as the PTA kind of like the overall kind of summary. I think it's a typo and we need to get that corrected. Carolyn, oh, you got it, okay. I was just about to get Carolyn um, Barnett. She pulled this data for us and so I wanted to get clarification on this, she, she is gone. She'll be back though. And we'll come back and we'll revisit this. Okay, cool. So we'll get, so you said it's if they've paid their dues, if they're members or officers, or is it just officers? It's officers and So we'll get a definition and make sure that we add that to the, um, and a page number on the top of page seven. Yes. Yes. Yes, because this was one of the questions that you all had, because what I wanted to make sure, whole, the whole body. Yeah, this whole thing, because we wanted to present a picture of the data and how things, you know, how, how, how the work is progressing. Now, these are some new slides on the bottom of seven around teacher uh, quality and teacher effectiveness, and I wanted you guys to see it. You may feel like this is not something that you want to include, but I wanted you guys to have an understanding around um, teacher quality versus teacher effectiveness, and Dr. Sullivan, pulled some slides. We may not need all three of these slides, but Dr. Sullivan, if you would walk through um, the, f the four slides. Let me give you a mic, too. Do you all mind if I sit and walk us through? Do I need to stand on parade? Okay. Um, okay, so this first slide, teacher quality versus teacher effectiveness, it's also the one that you see on the screen. The point of this slide is um, for those of you who might not be as aware of a lot of the research around teacher effectiveness um, and how this could relate to flexibility is that historically teacher certification, teacher experience, and teacher degree type like bachelors, masters, those are the things that have been used for both pay scales as well as in these um, federal uh, definitions of highly qualified teacher. However, um, the, the evidence has not um, demonstrated that those things matter. 
I have parentheses around teacher experience because there's kind of a mixed bag on that. Um, inexperienced teachers that are in their first uh, three years, year, year zero, one, and two, yeah, um, those teachers um, grow the most, but you know, there's a mixed bag of evidence out there around whether or not experience matters, and the only time you see when it does matter is when there's just this split between brand new baby inexperienced teachers compared to teachers on the other side of that hump. But if you just use the number of years as experience, it does not matter the longer you're teaching, we don't get better. Now we could have lots of conversations around why that's a problem because you'd think with professional learning and the more you're doing something, you ought to get better at it. So that's always been something that's problematic for me, but the research does not bear out that the longer you're here, the better you get at that job. Um, so I wanted to point that out that the, the field is moving where we're, we're decreasing the focus on those three things. Again, we're not there yet. Our salary scales are still based on there and the definitions of highly qualified teacher are still based on that. That's one of the things that we could potentially tinker with is this definition of highly qualified teacher. It's a federal requirement to have highly qualified teachers, but it's a Georgia rule that defines highly qualified teachers. Ellen. Yes, yes, both, thank you, thank you for saying that. So there's been a move historically um, to move towards measuring teacher effectiveness rather than teacher quality, right? Some people think that's just this language difference, but it's not, it's, it has meat on both sides of it. Teacher effectiveness is more about looking at student growth, student outcomes, student perception of their teachers, as well as in some measure of instructional practice. Our state in Georgia has moved towards that. We are still waiting on some of the metrics to tell us how all three of those things work together. But I just wanted everybody to have that kind of understanding that there are differences there because there are still things that we use like salary scale and other things um, that are in Georgia rule that are based on these quote archaic metrics, if you will, or perceptions of teachers. So that's that slide, okay? The next um, three are just different, um, different views of how these metrics look right now. So if you look at the first one, it's very colorful. I'm gonna try and walk you through these. You don't have to be an analyst to understand them, I promise, even though they might look a little bit intimidating. So on the left side, we have um, the teacher keys summative rating. That is the observation component. So that's principals going into classrooms and observing our teachers based on their instructional practice. There are 10 elements in there, and a teacher can be rated a zero, a one, a two, or a three on each one of those elements. So let's say a teacher is hitting on all of them. They're getting exemplary, they're getting a three. The highest you can make is a 30, right? Somebody that was proficient on everything would be a 20. So all you need to know from looking at this distribution is what number is the, are the most of our teachers on? 20. What's the tallest one? 20. That means proficient in everything. Now just stop for a second and think about all of the student outcome data we've looked at so far. Okay, just let that resonate with you for a second. Okay, so that's the left side of the pane. The colors are by cluster, but you could, I mean, that's just to tell you that that's what that means. We're not pay, really paying attention to that right now. And Wait, then Ruby, uh -huh. why, so why are some marked like 30? So 20 is? 20 is that you got a two, so you were deemed proficient on all 10 elements. Okay. A 30 is that you were given, and I think it's exemplary, is that the three? You were given an exemplary on all 10 elements. Okay. Yes, combinations, yeah, yeah. But typically what we, yeah, but if you, if, and if you hit at 20, then you're deemed in your overall, your summative as being effective or proficient. Um, okay, and then the one on the right are actually our internally, um, not the state, but our internal value added metrics. So this is actual student growth from one year to the next. And so um, you can see the distribution. A 3.0 is considered average growth, anything above a three is above average growth when children are compared to their um, peers, and anything below a three is below average growth. So it, again, that, the dis, just to get a sense of the shape of the distribution, okay? That's the only point here, is that on the observation data, 
we see most of our teachers being deemed you know, effective and above, um, but when it doesn't bear out on the student performance, student growth data, okay? So the next slide um, tells, it has the same uh, distributions, but what we've done now is color-coded these teachers by their final appraisal. So what that means is that they, at the end of the year, based on their observation data last school year, blue is exemplary, green proficient, orange needs development, and red ineffective. The left side are based on the observations, which is where those, the four, the summary comes from, right? But now look on the right side. This is the teacher, the value added score. You'll see that kind of regardless of where a teacher is on student growth or value added, there are many teachers in this district that are deemed proficient, even when their student growth is all the way down at you know, less than zero. So again, three is average. Two is one standard deviation below average. One is two standard deviations below average. We have teachers that are being deemed proficient that have student growth that is one, two, three plus standard deviations below average. Let's just look at the, there's teensy little red lines that you can kind of see in there of in, ineffective. Like there's one, there's a, I don't know if it's one teacher, but there's a really small line for ineffective in, that has um, value added of one standard deviation above average, so at four. So just to kind of give you a sense of these two metrics aren't really speaking to each other yet. Um, we've, they're, they're fairly new metrics too, so we've got a long way to go, but when we, start to think about how do we move away from this experience, certification, um, degree type, and we move towards these kind of improved metrics, it, as you, if you will, for teacher effectiveness. We've just got a lot more work to do on the observation calibration work. Linda? Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Not according to their final evaluations last year. And for those internal people, this is now in a dashboard and we can hover and drill into each one of these so you can actually get down into school level stuff. This was um, just like, this is in development right now, so I just pulled it off some screenshots for you guys. So you're actually the first people to see these views of these data. That's our internal value added model, which is based on our work with the Value Added Research Center at the University of Wisconsin. The third, um, the third and final slide as it relates to this, this is, these are scatter plots on the left. Um, yeah, sure. So um, the, because this, these data only compare teachers inside APS, it's like a force distribution where half of our teachers would produce um, above average results and half below. So we don't have a metric to compare it to where it's um, um, like how much growth is enough growth. That's a question we're still trying to unpack, if that helps any. If we use the state student growth model, then we can get a sense of how, how we look compared to other teachers across the state, but because this model is just using APS data, it's a forced distribution where um, 3.0 represents average student growth in APS. And that controls for um, anything that um, had a significant effect on student learning outcomes in Atlanta. So here it is free reduced lunch status, English learner status, students with disability status, race, ethnicity, homelessness not anymore, that doesn't have an effect. So all of those things. Okay, the last one is, um, the last one for this, uh, these are scatter plots. On the x-axis, it's the, that TECAS value, which is just that observation, right? Remember up to 30, same scale from before. Again, you see the clusters on 20. You see that the spread, if you just look horizontally, is really only going from about, you know, somewhere just above 15 up to 30. Very few teachers down on the lower end on um, the observations. And then on the um, y-axis is the value added. 
So both of these graphs use that, use those com two comparisons. We're putting both of these on one scale in a scatter plot. The left side, each dot is a um, school. And on the right side, each dot is a teacher. So you can see the, just if you just focus on the wide range of the, the value added, and again, given the context we just talked about, that's, you know, we intentionally look at it that way to see who's above versus who's below average in Atlanta public schools. But then th we're very right skewed or very biased, if you will, on the upper end of the observations. So the, the, there's a lot of reasons for that. Very, it's a Lake Wobegon effect for people who didn't hear that, yes. I think there, I mean, I can, we have people who, um, the standard for what effective instruction looks like in Atlanta public schools sometimes gets skewed by what effective instruction looks like in my building because I'm only seeing effective instruction, I'm only seeing instruction in my building versus what effective instruction might look like, you know, setting a standard district wide. This metric, this rubric based metric for evaluations is fairly new. Um, um, it hasn't been, been used that much yet. We're still grounding people in the rubric itself. I mean, we have principals here who have to use this, so um, they could probably speak to more of the reasons why we see some of these effects, but that is not a phenomenon that's unique to Atlanta Public Schools either, because the nation is moving in this direction, and nationally we still see the majority of teachers, like 90% plus is typical what you see as effective across the country. It's not unique to Atlanta, but it just demonstrates the struggle to transition from um, the same things we pay on, um, experience and um, um, certification type and um, degree type. That struggle to move us, even now with the, you know, a few years ago we were talking about can we get better metrics. Now we have the better metrics and better tools, but we still haven't quite moved there. So that was just to give everybody a sense of that, of that struggle. Um, Angela just asked that I share it with you. students are above would you you would that is, I can yes, tell no. you that that is not what you'll see when you click on, when you click on the yellow dot on the left in our uh, dashboard the right just will show those teachers in that school and so you see how they're all like really close to excellent when you hit it and you see where they are on value add it's like they spread as you can imagine right they're not quite as excellent in producing student growth as they are being perceived by the person observing them Um, so I was just going to suggest that, it, so it seems like, you know, we added four slides. I was thinking, you know, in that maybe we could just um, cut it down to the two. Like it seems like the, the chart with the arrows and then the bottom green chart kind of, I think, tells the story of this, what you're talking about, the struggle between like perceived, observed quality and student outcome. Okay. Yeah. It's great. Works for me. Some. Works for me too. Giving me less slides is always a good thing. <laughs> yep. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Um, so highlighted on the bottom of page nine is kind of the key issues that we've looked at um, as a team that graduation rates are significantly below the 90% aspiration, and you know that 90% aspiration is coming from the board's new mission and vision, that that's kind of the target right now. And that's by 2019, okay. Overall achievement needs to be improved across the subject areas and grade levels. Student attendance needs to be addressed. Despite the critical link between college attendance and post-secondary success, we we know that there's a gap in terms of college um, attendance and enrollment. Um, while APS has some talented and experienced teachers, instructional capacity needs to be improved. Parent and community engagement vary widely across our schools based off of the information that we've received um, 
around the PTAs and local school councils. Um, this one is, yes. Yeah. So you'll see that this kind of outlines the problems, but on the strategy slide, you'll see that's coming up, or the high level strategy slide, it does address compensation, I think. Hold on, hold that thought. Um, changing and addressing the organizational structure or culture is very important to our overall system, and I, we heard that from a lot of the inputs that people were saying at our community meetings. And then operational systems, actually, I need to take that one off. Number nine needs to come off. So if you'll turn to the back page, is the logic map that you all saw last week in um, recruit and retain the best talent at APS is in there, continually develop, recognize, and compensate staff in the purple is in there so that we'll be an energized and inspired team of employees. I think that this statement's in draft mode, but you can kind of see that, 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 um, that all of the things that are addressed in terms of the key issues are outlined in the strategy or the, the logic map. Slide 20, um, we talked about last week um, in terms of managed instruction, managed performance, and performance empowerment. I actually want to show you a draft um, that the senior team has been looking at in terms of what we're calling collaborative alignment, in terms of how we would look at how we might approach our theory of action. Slide 21, um, we looked at from a strategy and a theory of action, how do we improve instructional and drive instructional change? At the central office, we think that we need to look at how do we um, provide support around standards, curriculum, scope and sequence, pacing guides, and interim assessments. Um, at the cluster level, um, and you'll notice we called out the cluster level, we felt it was important to provide support, and um, that the, the cluster level that they look at the instructional model courses, instructional materials, um, such as textbooks, technology, supplemental materials at the cluster level, and then at the school level, um, lesson planning, scheduling, staffing, and hiring. And then shared responsibility um, for the following items across central office, cluster, and school included planning, budgeting, and instructional support. So the senior team's been trying to think about if we had a, a theory of action, what, what might it look like? And if we were gonna have central or, uh, centralized versus a decentralized versus a balanced approach, what things might be distributed and how might it look? And this was kind of the output of that conversation, yes? No, actually it's in there. That's what the staffing and the hiring, that was that kind of what it was oh, denoted, okay. is that, um, that at the school level, that the staffing um, and selecting staff and looking at how you might configure your staff, actually was, there was autonomy kind of given and support given, but that, um, that the budgeting process happens at all three tiers, that it needs to happen at all three tiers and not just at one of the tiers that it needs to be connected and interconnected. And so that, and it needs to be aligned, which is why the kind of the collaborative alignment title across the page was that at the schools that they needed to have support and to be able to look at um, the budgeting process, the instructional support process, the planning process, as well as the scheduling, staffing, and hiring process and le lesson planning process. That's how you could kind of read that. But it needs to, but the things on the bottom also need to be collect, connected at the cluster level so planning needs to happen at the cluster level. Budgeting needs to happen at the cluster level, instructional support. And at the central office level, it also needs to happen, planning, budgeting, and instructional support. So we didn't get into the details. This primarily is focused on the, like a theory of action is primarily focused at the instructional component, like what things do you need to drive and support instruction? So the operations, we kind of took that out of our conversation. Um, 
It was more about around instruction. And so you'll see at the bottom is kind of like a written description of what we thought our theory of action for change included. Um, once again, this is a draft, it's, it's in progress. At Atlanta Public Schools, we believe that schools, clusters, and the central office must be aligned and collaborate to ensure that every child is college and career ready. This means that school leaders will be empowered to ensure that they have the right staff in their building, the right schedule, the right lessons to meet their students' needs. Clusters will have the autonomy to innovate with instructional models, courses, and instructional materials. The central office will uh, manage standards, curriculum, scope and sequence, pacing guides, and interim assessments to ensure excellence and equity across the district. Great comment, and I'm gonna take that, take that back. The work hasn't been done, we're not even close to being there, but it is an important part where we kind of left off, of, we had a pause. Other thoughts, comments? Let's read it. I'm not sure where the special programs would fall in order to um, support students for their to in order for there to be to meet students' needs, it kind of goes beyond just preparing great lesson plans, um, because we have many students across the district, and this is in many schools um, where they have challenges even with the basic needs, um, where we have to. So I'm just wondering where the special programs would fall for us to uh, clothe them, to feed them extra to give them those extra things before we even begin to teach them. Because um, I see where we, we talk about the right lesson plans to meet their, the students' needs and also college and career ready, but I find that in, even at schools that I've visited, high schools, um, they're having challenges even with basic needs and those social issues that plague them, um, like the attempted suicides and the um, bullying and just the basic things that will take them away from the instructional piece. So all of that's really important, operations, student support. The purpose of a theory of action for change is to really boil down our concept of what is going to be the thing that makes the difference to get us there. And then, so you figure out what your theory of action is. So if you're a Gwinnett County, your theory of action is like really about kind of managed instruction and managed performance. If you're Bolton County, their theory of action is about decentralization. So, and then you align, you figure out what the theory is, what the core is, and then everything else is supposed to be aligned around that. So like if school-based planning for scheduling is part of our theory of action, then transportation would need to align with whatever that core plan would be for that school and that cluster. Um, does, that, does that make sense? So like all of those other things have to happen to support this and maybe we need to add like um, just a statement to the, the paragraph that says that, but I think that kind of the point of this is not to be everything in the kitchen sink that we do, because we do, I mean, we're a $600 million business um, in some ways, and we do a lot of those things. We provide 80,000 meals every day to kids, um, but that's all kind of support that is around whatever this theory of action ends up being in the end. So I was just t yeah. sort of trying to clarify that's like what the purpose of this um, statement is in the policy world where these things um, have been created in, in other districts. Not sure whose hand was up first. Okay, that's helpful. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
So maybe with the first bullet under the theory of action, we can say something that um, all of this will happen, all of this is embedded with the school leader as reflects the community or cultural concerns of that school. And maybe that would catch some of the individual issues that are just as important as instruction, but that are specific to that location. Mm -hmm. And only that school leader would know about them. But I, I think it is important to say that all of this has to reflect back on the specific community or cultural leadership. Mm -hmm. And then I know Maria had her hand. Okay. Um, one concern that I have with the ability to make decisions at the cluster level is because of our mobility rate. Because we have a 30% mobility rate, half of those children move within district. But I know a few years back we tried to see if they were moving within cluster um, through another project and it didn't look like that. Our children are just, they're just moving all over the place. It's not within community or within cluster. And so if cluster decisions are being made around instructional model and courses, um, that could really negatively affect our most vulnerable population, which would be our mobile students. I just, I, I'm, I'm gonna piggyback on what she was saying. Um, when I look at this um, and understanding the information that she just shared, I think Rebecca, about um, our theory of action for change, it looks like it's mostly about instruction. And so, you know, the only concern I would add is that we, to her point, there are so many compounding issues um, in our communities that our children are contending with before they even arrive in the school building that to not have that as a part of sort of the broad scope of you know what we do I, I don't know if that I just wonder if there's a way to make sure that that's included mm -hmm. I don't know what the terminology it is mm -hmm. I don't know if it's wraparound services I'm not sure what but I know that it's it would you know, for me I look at this and I see instruction 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 and instruction is critically important but not solely the issue we're dealing with in Atlanta So I know that we have lesson plans down for the school because that's the how mm -hmm. we're going to implement the standards, mm -hmm. but I think we should also consider looking at the instructional practices that are used at the school as well. Uh, instructional model is, to me, different from instructional practices, and I think that that's something that schools should have ownership of, and that's going to be just as important in the classroom. So instructional practices okay. under, under school. school. Okay. I'm going to add that as a bullet. Okay, this is all helpful. I'm going to take it, take it all back. Okay. So, so Dr. Anderson, I just want to make it clear. So you're saying that, so, so that plays out with the principal having to then dictate or be able to, not dictate, but um, decide on what the instructional practice will be for that school, or is that what you're saying? So kind of like what Ruby said, the concern with the cluster, having the ability to make decisions about the instructional model courses, materials, et cetera, that's kind of, it, it can be looked at two ways. It's important because all of the feeder schools need to be in sync in order to prepare their kids equally for their feeders. However, if what we're doing amongst clusters does vary, then the kids, like at my school, that come back and forth will never catch them up in order to prepare them for Inman because they've been prepared differently or yeah, different programs just require so much um, training and and experience and you know whether it's 
I don't know, I, I could go on forever, but I think it's important because if within our feeder pattern, just using us, for example, going to Inman, if we are all not talking and in sync, then they're going to go into Inman at varied levels. Yes, so I think the thought was um, that the curriculum and the standards and the scope and sequence would ensure that the same material or the same information and standards and expectations would be covered over a period of time and that that would be consistent across the system um, for all, for, you know, K-12. And that the, I think the thought here with the instructional model um, was that, like you were saying, if you, at, at the cluster level, having all this, and I'm just, I'm using IB as an example, but if, the, if, the, if a cluster is an IB cluster, that you're making sure that, that there's consistency in terms of that particular instructional model. Um, but that the standards and that the, the standards, the pace, the content, um, the learning goals would need to be the same across the system, which is why it's, it's under central office. I think that was the thing. So do we have, do we currently have the capacity at central office to produce that level of work? Um, I don't know. This was, once again, this is, this is part of the strategic plan okay. in terms of this is where we need to get to. Okay. Um, and this also, what was used to drive kind of the input into this was the last principal meeting where we asked about the priorities and the work and where did you all want us to focus? And we heard overwhelmingly that um, you wanted support as it related to the curriculum, that you don't, you don't necessarily have what you need now as it relates to the curriculum and the standards and the materials and that you wanted support. And so that's why you see that, that in the central office, you all said a priority is for central office to be able to produce these things. So my question is, so as a parent, uh -huh. You know, so I'm gonna break it up real simple. Mm -hmm. This math versus that math, old math versus new math. How do I keep up at each school and the practices? You know, mommy, we don't do it this way, Pat. We don't do it this way in school. And so we get lost in that. And since we're moving 30%, you know, that can be a huge problem for us. And then another question, to go back a, little, a slide to, it, it would be with our teacher um, effectiveness uh, and then being rated. You know, so are our teachers, are we, are, there's a data showing, I guess for you, Dr. Sullivan, there's a data showing question to you right now, but do you feel, based on what your data says, that our teachers will be able to um, handle this kind of, or not just teachers, but our staff at the local school site could handle that type of um, responsibility? So I, th I think the no. So I think that's some some good feedback in terms of this. I think once again this is intent. I'm leading. I'm I'm le uh, I'm reading into this. But I think that the intent is that the core courses would be consistent across the system, but special. You know, at schools, um, with based off of your uh, your. Uh, well, Cluster. Are you saying, for example, like a feeder pattern may have um, Spanish yes. as their core within that mm -hmm. feeder pattern, or as another one, mm -hmm. feeder pattern may have questions about what you mm -hmm. mean. Uh huh. The normal stuff. Mm hmm.
woman to say that I have HIV and IV, and so they're they're gonna get around. You know those things. Yeah, that was. So for me, uh, follow, uh, my question would be then, um, are we going to take into account the ability then to uh, maybe do transfers so that students aren't, you know, tracked in certain ways or, you know, if, if I want to go across district because you have a program being offered there that's not being offered where I am, um, is that going to be fair? You know, is it, you know, can I, as a parent, go to a STEM program that my high school, my cousin might not offer a STEM program that I want? I guess, yeah, I'm tagging on to this. Well, I guess so. I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm that. Gonna actually. Um, yeah, this mic's over here. Oh. I saw a hand. Someone's loud. Um, okay, hold on. I guess I'm thinking then, what is the fallout? What are the unintended consequences? What are, you know, parents who are, you know, you know falsifying documents, you know, to get to different schools? Um, we, have, we have a whole problem with capacity <laughs> at different kinds of schools right now. You know, we have. Underpopulated, and so you know, unless we find a way to kind of you know, un unless that baseline course offering is is so strong across and maybe just a few specialties, then we're gonna I'm telling you, we're gonna run to the, what we you know to what we think is better for our kids. I had a conversation with a parent of the day and with a student who said, "Listen, my school doesn't offer AP, and does not make me as compat it doesn't make me as competitive to other people who have AP when I'm trying to get to my college." <coughs> okay. Comment, oh, comment, comment in a question. I'm just thinking back about what we originally passed for in this group, and I'm just theory of action is part of it. It's not, which is why I, I wanted to bring it as a piece of information, but not to, to, to belabor this, because we, we have a lot more work to do. So I want to move us along. He said, he said that we weren't tasked to do the theory of action. That was his question. So, and, and he's right, and actually that's why I'm, I'm standing up, just to move us along, because we have, I, I, this was a, a piece of information to present, and we got great feedback, and I'm gonna take it all back. It's all extremely helpful, um, but it's a piece of information just to kind of, you can kind of see some of the thinking that's been happening in terms of the system. Just to kind of to close that out, to cl kind of close that out and move on, I mean, I think, you're right, I think we could spend a whole meeting on theory of action, it's not really our charge to do so, but I think it definitely speaks to what kind of model we might choose. I mean, because I think certain models lend themselves to decentralization or centralization, and I think that's a consideration. So I guess the only feedback I would have on this model is, the examples you gave are very clear cut, like Gwinnett, is, you kind of know how that works, it's centralized, you know that Fulton's decentralized. If we're gonna do a hybrid, that's fine, but I think we just have to be very clear on like this is where this happens, and this is where the support is for that. So that I mean, so I think, you know, okay, great summary. And so I'm gonna move us along because I wanna. <clears throat> y'all didn't have that piece of information as y'all were voting, and so I wanna actually look at the re results from your vote. Um, so slide twenty. Uh, five, where it says insert, insert state slides. I did not do that today because it would have just been um, too much. Um, but a lot of the slides that we receive from the state go there. So that it explains kind of what the models are and all the details. And that is from the presentation we received September 12th. Um, the 20, on the, third, on the bottom of 13, stakeholder interests, 
this is the information, and you have a full report from Clara in your, it's clarification and mediation. All of the questions that were asked and kind of the themes to date for each of the community meetings you have um, at your, in front of you. Um, and so I'm gonna let you read that, you know, in your leisure, but slides 26 and slides 27 kind of highlight both um, their interests, the things that were exciting, and those things that showed up as concerns. <clears throat> the bottom of page 14, you see that is um, the advantages and disadvantages. As you know, that when the community members broke into groups, they were asked to provide advantages and disadvantages for their work. And so you see on the bottom of page 14 and um, uh, page 14 and page 15, you see the advantages and disadvantages that they outlined for each of the models, um, which are many of the same things that we have said um, that in, the, in this group. Um, I don't think there's not, not one thing in here that they said that we didn't say, or vice versa. Um, so I, the, the, that highlights, but they didn't have the um, luxury of seeing the revised slides. Um, and so we'll just denote that, because that information came before the state information changing um, on September 12th. So page 16 and page 17 are the uh, language that you all provided and I tweaked based off of the input that you gave to us last week um, in terms of the advantages, the disadvantages, and the key considerations for each piece. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time, I know I see, I see a, I see a money thing, um, Chuck, I'm going to correct the money uh, amount at the top of page 17. It just jumps out at me right now. And Chuck, it should, the total amount between class size waiver and the 65%, what should it be? Or should it say $22 million for the class size waiver and 10 million, 15 million for 65%? Or is it a combination of 40? Combination. Okay, combination. We're going to correct the language. That's the yeah. total. One year. Okay. All righty. Um, so let's take a look at kind of what you all said in terms of so that we can have time to discuss it, debrief about it. Um, okay, so you all asked me to do a decision tree, and um, it was a little bit harder than y'all made it seem. I'll just say it like that. Because as I was thinking about it, I was like, there's a lot of questions that one might ask. So at the top of eight, uh, page 18 is the one that I had. The bottom of 18 is one that actually the state provided in terms of what's your preference for a particular leadership approach. And then the top of 19 are the key questions that I came up with. But I really kind of felt like depending on how you answered each of these, you could end up with two models at the same time. There was no like clear cut winner. Like, like okay, so you want one that drives more, uh, that drives you know, student improvement, okay, well that could end up being two of them. Or if you want something that supports, you know, um, engagement, well, you can do that under IU Square, technically. It's not a requirement, but you could do it. So I really struggled with the, uh, the choices. Like I felt like depending, because the application and the petition 
is designed based off of what you're trying to outline to for your strategic plan, I kind of felt like you could end up going either way. So I struggled. So if you all have thoughts about how to handle that, or you can help me spend some time to kind of mapping it out, I, you can? Awesome. OK. Well, um, I, will <laughs> I think you can too. One, like I'll say that I, I think that the two <coughs> questions where there is a very clear difference is do you want targets at the school level or the system level? And do you want specific waivers or full flexibility waiver? Those are good. Those two are very clear cut choices, and the rest of it can really be done under. Yeah. Do you want mandated local governance? Okay. That would be the other one. See, y'all should just should have just done did the slide. Okay. <laughs> I did. Maybe I didn't think about it in terms of a decision tree. I think I started drawing the lines. I was like, oh my goodness. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll try again on the decision tree. Um, okay. So. Uh, the, Yes. No, no, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Fantastic. Um, so there was a question around, okay, wait. I'm going to skip the bottom of 19 for a second. Uh, well, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over the next few slides, and then I'm just going to get to the punchline. So you all said, so go to page 22, and then we'll, ba we'll back up. And you'll see the reason why I pulled the following slides. So go to page 22. And I'm sorry, there's not a slide number. You'll see two pie charts. Do we need flexibility? Yeah. Do we need flexibility? You all said, 84% of you said that you believe that APS needs flexibility through waivers of law, rules, and policy to raise student achievement and operate successfully as a school system. You all said, and you can see the data at the bottom. You all said, and this part confused me, so this is where we need to discuss, because I was a little confused. Of the flexibility options available to APS, which model do you believe benefits APS the most? So, 36% said charter system, 24% said IE squared, 28% said a system of charter clusters. 4% said a system of charter schools. And, then, and status quo was 8%. I'm not sure why it says none there, but status, status quo was 8%. No waivers, no waivers, no waivers, no flexibility. I need to change that, and the key is confusing. Okay, so I was a little confused, so I need you to share your thoughts in terms of a system of, okay, well, the one that threw me the most um, was a system of charter schools. I didn't understand how that got selected in terms of, uh-uh. Charter system. What what was the th what was the comment? You gave us five options. That's not really an option. That's the reason why I. That's why I think I was confused. Uh huh. Yeah.
then the preference, oh. but then the preference was status quo for a year with an option to choose. Okay, later. so so let me make sure I think I so okay. your options First changed so, a little. So so. It sounds like the ordering of the questions, because this one came first, was confusing. I won't say confusing. I was like, oh, I didn't know that was an option. Because okay. it's like question number four said status quo, five years. Then okay. the next question said status so quo I think, for a year. So I listed option. those options that we had kind of covered in terms of the law. Not the courses of action, not the possible recommendations, but the things that are outlined, you know, in the law, like the, the but we kind of had talked about and from our information that we received from like Lou and Laura and various people that a system of charter school, I'm gonna just use that as an example. A system of charter schools isn't really viable because that means every school would have to be independent. It did only get right. one vote. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that. Okay. All right. So. Okay. Well, that was there. It just was on question. It was under question. The following. So turn the page. So I I deduced that, but I just wanted to make sure I was clear when I was looking at the results. Um. Go ahead, Claire. feel like at this point two of the models are so similar I wish I had the choice of like indifferent between indifferent. charter system and, and I squared because I like I go back to my other point that I feel like I feel like APS could make either work based on where else they're going okay and so like I felt like I had to pick one so I picked a one that was like slightly preferred but I mean I don't know maybe no one else is in this boat but I just feel like they've become so close Okay, so, and I, I, I kind of saw that from the results. Given that 36% was charter system, and then the next, and you can see it's very close, charter system, I E squared, and system of charter clusters. Those, they, they, you can see it. They, what you just said, Claire, to me is what is on the paper, is that it's very close. There's not necessarily a clear indicator per se. It, Mm -hmm. We're not talking about that many people. You're right. So, go ahead. So, like Stephanie was saying, if you sort of assumed that the system of charter clusters, people would also think that a charter system with a cluster-based approach would be a good selection, then that would be, you know, 16 with that. And maybe that's not true. I don't know. Um, but I think that it, like when you look at the when you look at the next one yeah it, it yeah so it the next one made me think that the the folks that asked for or that indicated uh, that indicated on the previous page system of charter clusters that you really liked the implementation of a cluster driven charter system approach based off of, because that is the biggest blue, the royal blue, is what you all indicated. Then the next color was the orange, which was just the regular charter system with local school governance. Just no, no cluster, but just local school governance with the next, you know, preferred. Because this shows rank order first, the far left-hand side, the best choice, your number one choice, you were to force rank your number one choice, and this is how it stacked up. You said charter system with a cluster governance model and cluster driven implementation. Then you said a charter system with local school governance was the next thing, and then IE squared, and then status quo for an interim period, and then reevaluate after one year. That's what you said. Go ahead. 
reflect or something. I don't know. But okay, so with the, with the light blue, yep. status quo for a short period of time, and then yep. improve it after one year. That was the most chosen thing you're saying? No. no. Okay. The most chosen was charter system. Go from the bottom. The bottom up. Okay. The largest block of color is the choice that was first, and then the orange, and then the blue, and then status quo. And then, so that was first choice. And then the question was, okay, what's your second choice? And you couldn't, your second choice in terms of how you ordered it was charter system again, charter system again, a little teeny people, people said I squared for their second choice, and then a little teeny, uh, then status quo for a short interim period um, was the, the next blue, and then status quo for a five year period. Then here's your third choice in the middle, how you would wanna rank it. Once again, charter system is your first, and then charter system, and then I squared. The, the, the number of people yep. who picked that for their third choice. Uh-huh, that's how many people third picked choice. as a third the choice. I and then this was the least desirable was, you can see the dark blue now, there's, it's greater. Most popular. Yep. It's IE squared. We'll do that. Yes, comments, thoughts. sentiments of the room yep. if we had to make a choice between the top two vote getters mm -hmm. among those five um, and then my second point was that I believe that I believe that there are substantive differences between the charter system and the charter system cluster base so you cannot necessarily say that oh if you're for one then you're also for the other I think there's significant differences <coughs> there but I think all of that is resolved if we're faced with a choice between what are the top two options at this point. But okay. Angela, are all five really viable options or are we still bound with the three that are recognized by the state? Or so one? which five are you talking about? Well, So as a model, as a model in of themselves, a charter cluster is not by itself, the model by itself is not viable because we would have to do nine applications or 10, whatever, how many clusters we have, nine or 10 clusters. It's supposed to be grassroots, which means it's supposed to come from the cluster. It's not supposed to come from central office. That's the whole point of that model, is that it's supposed to be decentralized, completely decentralized. Um, but is it recognized by the state as a... It is, it is. There are no rules, which is why it, it, it's, it's not really viable. Uh-huh, that's what, that's what Laura said. Are, is cluster defined by the high school cluster? Yes. Is that has to be? So it would be like the In their language, it says the feeder schools. I think it says the feeder schools for a high school. Uh huh. That's what it says. Mm hmm. The high school and it's all those feeder schools. That's how they define it. I want you to be clear that when you on your first question that we're discussing, you didn't state whether or not an option had to be viable. You just asked what was our preference that we thought would be best. 
Okay, so y'all. It was not until the second question that you could I, have So I should have clarified it. the question. Is that what I'm hearing? It's well, okay. It really is three. Yes. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. So what I heard in the, the round was that, one, Angela needs to revise this question. It's okay. To include the viable big options for systems of our size. Okay. So we're going to revise uh, slide 22. Um, and I'm going to resend out the question. Now, what I want to hear clear. Yes, I did. I constrained it. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I heard delete the, delete the response. Take that slide out. And the question was. Oh, oh, I don't know why I'm talking in the mic when I have a mic on my body. Go ahead. Worth hearing twice. <laughs> now, uh, what I was just observing is that, and I think what we're heading toward, you just delete the slide with the pie chart on it that has the system of charters and system of charter clusters, and just go with the slide where we forced ranked our preferences one through five, that our choices were a charter system i.e. squared, uh, a charter systems with a cluster. Th this slide is probably the one that we use to, to actually reveal our preference as uh, opposed to the pie chart slide. I don't think it's the data is accurate, though, because I don't think it's like the data is accurate. I'm not, I just, I think that it's convoluted by all these other things that we really haven't talked about or something that we've gotten to. And so I think the data is not. Well, some of these other things would have been a strategy That's a strategic decision we make after we decide whether we're going to be a charter system. So you're right, there really are only three viable choices. So we might need, I um, see your point, we, we need to rephrase it and go back. Okay, rephrase and go back. And But I want to go back to what Erica said, or, oh, okay. Or, go ahead. And this, I mean, you all would have to tell me if you're, you would all have to accept this, but if you, um, if we merge, so the, the, the orange and the, blue that royal blue they're both charter system one with local school governance the other one with local and cluster governance but they're both charter system so we merge those two together we code those together i e squared only has one option on there that stands alone and then we have two for status quo one is with a five-year period and one is with a short interim period of one and if everybody agreed to that we could merge those two together and then you wouldn't have to redo the survey because you've got the three options in there the only thing that gives me pause on that, like I'm comfortable with it on the charter system, but because the status quo has that one year versus five year, as opposed to just different governance types, the one year, you know, we'd have to make another decision later. Yeah, just like the two governance systems are both viable, but we could merge those together and you would have results of charter versus IE squared versus status quo, but just merge those two categories within charter and the two categories within status quo for the numbers. I guess the reason the answer for me, Dr. Sullivan, I guess for me, if I knew that um, after one year, see, one of my, my concerns was I didn't think, when I answered it, was that we were ready to do, you know, a charter system. Even though I wanted to say, I, I'm not saying I do, but let's say I did want a charter system and I didn't feel like we were ready for it, then I couldn't pick that because that was informing my decision. Well, that, so I don't really have. I also think that one thing that you could do is instead of the chart that we had on page, the bottom of page 22, that if you did a pie chart with our, with our number one rank responses, um, that that kind of gets at it. Because I mean, I think that it's very telling that zero people, it appears, selected long-term status quo as the top option, which means that it probably isn't a great idea to combine the two status quo choices, you know, I, it's more. Yeah, I, I would prefer to really show, I agree that the slide on the back is confusing. Um, and it doesn't necessarily get 
to what I think that you guys were saying, but I do think that the, the information and how you stacked them up, you all came up with these options and said, here are what, and last week you took some options off the table because you said it's not viable or, you know, one of them. So we, we, con we consolidated some, um, but I think that you're right. Maybe we highlight it by showing preference one or priority one, and then you can also see the slide, uh, tw uh, the top of 23 as well. But this, uh, but I want to go back to Erica's question. Do we need to force, or do we leave it like this, and this is just kind of how you felt? Can you go back up a slide? Can you go back oh, up a slide? Oh, uh, can you turn, uh, go back? Yeah. So, so and I'm sorry, I don't know everybody's name here, okay. but if you look, there's three choices. So status quo, charter of some, some form, and I squared. If you look at the numbers, it's 68%, 24%, and 8% pretty consistent with the previous one. If you take your 68% now, your charter, mm -hmm. and break it out into what's the priority within that, and wh where's that go? Nine, so a little over 50% are for a system charter. Um, a little less than 50% prefer cluster of some form, and then there's a sole vote for a school-based school charter system. Mm -hmm. And you get the same thing, and I think if you go, now you go to I think you have a lot less noise if you go to the next slide. You have two pie charts mm -hmm. breaking it out and you don't, you avoid the noise in this chart. I yeah. do this a lot and I wouldn't put that up in okay. front of anybody. Okay, I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna get my slides all tied up. Oh, here you go. Thank you, I was like, I'll see you. I'm, I'm, I'll come by in a minute. Yes. 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 The pie chart was. No, the pie chart is the model and why. But I could tell when I was reading the comments that you, there were aspects of it or governance and this. So I could kind of tell that's what you were saying, but I just wanted to ask because I wasn't clear. And so um, I want to go back. So I like your f feedback in terms of how to display the data. I, I, but I want to. So, so if we were to do it that way, you would kind of, the pie chart would indicate a clear -er picture. A clear -er picture, yes. How about I do this? So tomorrow, I'll redo the charts, and I can send it back out so that you can see it like Rich was saying about the, you know, how the picture, because I do think it will be clearer. <laughs> because really, you're gonna you're gonna see the kind of the three options in in all of the charts, and they'll be clearly outlined. But um, so the question is, do do we need to ask the question again? I I, I personally believe that, that would be ideal. Okay. I guess I would need to be made to understand what we lose by taking a clean vote based on what our actual viable options are. If that's four options, charter, i.e. squared, status quo for a year, status quo for five years, I can't imagine what the harm would be in just taking that simple question. Okay. Comments? What the harm would be. <coughs> what the harm would be. And so our, let me make sure I'm clear. So on page 23 at the top, are all these viable or are there some that are not viable? Do you think that are not viable? So we've got status quo for five years, status quo for interim period and reevaluate after a year. I squared and then charter system like Fulton did it or charter system with local governance so you have to have the local governance, but then we would overlay that with a cluster governance model. We're going to do it a little differently because it's yeah. Correct. Correct. Your application. We would just.
He said to Okay. Compiled. Yep. But there's really three options. So status quo for a year was after a year we would reevaluate where we are, give the system time, give the superintendent time, and then try and reapply for something you know that might be more fitting at the time. Mm -hmm. You could be status quo and reapply, but what Lou said was um, it would, we would lose the waivers and we would have to wait, you know, in line to apply and then that might take time and that it may take two years or 18 months. Okay, so what I've heard was, okay, so I heard two things. Erica said there's some clear winners and, and that maybe between the two that are obvious choices that are, have come up as the two obvious winners not a clear winner, a clear so we have the top two or, vote. or do we take a clean vote amongst the three okay so So, not making a decision is a decision. Not making a decision is a decision. So I okay. So, so here's I hear there's three. So what we can do because I do think the work that you did in terms of brainstorming how to kind of go about these models is important information for the superintendent and the board to consider. But just as a consideration, as a way to go about it, but it's up to them on how they implement. So it sounds to me like we want to do a clean vote on the three, the main three that are viable options. And that it would, the vote would be on status quo, uh, charter system, and IE squared. That's it. Yes. Yeah, we could do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, what we can do is, Melvin and Gail, can you all get some paper? Can you type up the paper and put IE squared, charter system, and um, the status quo, all three on there, and like a ballot, we're going to go around the table, and I need 30 sheets. Okay. All right. So then I won't have to email you tomorrow. <laughs> yes, you can text her. Cat's not here. I'll have to I'll email I can email Um okay. An accounting firm. We need an accounting firm. A poll everywhere. I still may have to, uh, even though I know we're doing the paper now, and we'll see where we all shake out. For record, I still probably will have to take this as an electronic vote. Yeah, so Jermaine um, is no longer principal. He is, for the system, he's got a promotion, and so he's not on our committee anymore. Um, our teacher of the year from North Atlanta, um, her workload, she just said, I can't, you know. She's teacher of the year, she's dedicated, she, 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 she just couldn't um, manage, and so that's the reason why we haven't seen her. Um, Kat is here, and she just couldn't be here tonight. Um, Janet is on vacation, but she has been emailing me this afternoon. 
Yeah, she told, yes, yes, she did. She, she emailed me earlier today. Um, but I think everybody else is here. And Tammy, as I said, I knew there was three. Tammy is at the town hall that's happening over um, at best. Um, but I will get there. But what, what, okay, so there, because I probably need to capture this electronically, though this will be helpful to go ahead and knock this out tonight, I probably still have to capture it electronically anyway, um, just so that I have it, I have it. So, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. So if I'm gonna have to do that anyway. Do y'all wanna? You, okay, so you, which is part of the reason why we're having the discussion. If the, I mean, that's part of the discussion tonight was to, you know, make sure you, you're good with where you are and how it is. And if there's anybody who wants to persuade anybody, you know, there was some, you had some big thought or change of heart or any, any big thoughts. Okay, so bottom of page 23, we're almost there. 744. Okay. I have 45 minutes before you get to scandal. Okay. Given the research on the models, the community input and feedback, so this would be based off of our vote, and I will send this back out and y'all tell me. So this is what it looks like. Um, that this district, we're recommending that the district move forward with a decision that includes an operating model that allows for flexibility. And this was the order of preference that I saw from the previous chart. Charter system with a, you know, a, some kind of a cluster model and cluster implementation, um, or two, just a charter system with local governance, and three, IE squared, that was the order. Um, in terms of another recommendation to move forward with a model that incorporates a cluster structure as a part of the, and I don't know what the right words are, a, as a part of the operations, as a part of planning, as a part of communication to drive engagement. But uh, you guys have said that and our communities have said that too. Um, in terms of if you go into some of the community feedback, you see that. Um, and then to, this is what you all said last week. And I went, went forward and I have put it in place in terms of the board docs, how we kind of move information through for voting that we adjust the timeline in the, in the following manner. One, we present the recommendation or the superintendent would present the recommendation for first reading in October. So she would come out and she would say, the board and I feel that we're gonna move forward with X recommendation. And it, it could be counter to what we say on this thing. We're just advisory, so. But she would come out in October and she would say that in a first reading but the board would not vote. The board would not vote. It would give people 30 days to talk with their board member, 30 days to ask questions, 30 days to you know, submit their comments and to comment at the board meeting. But then they would take a vote in November for the model that they had recommended in October and complete the letter of intent and submit the letter of intent in November. And then develop a system application um, in the months of November and December for a submission in January. So that was the adjusted timeline that you all had suggested last week. And I kind of, because it takes a minute to kind of get things established in, in our board process, I've put this in, in motion. So if there is um, any unrest with the timeline, now would be a good time to say yes. Uh, my concern is with the third dash, the application development in November and December for submission in January. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned why we would rush through that when we would have a year, a baseline year, where we would have waivers. Why would we not take the time and really do this right with our community? Okay, good comment. Thoughts? Because, so, th if we did that, that would be fine. We would just need to submit 
for our waivers for the upcoming school year. And then we could change this language to say develop application over, you know, over a period. Um, and then just submit just for the waivers we need for the 15-16 school year in January. Because that's what Lou, you know, remember that's what Lou advised us. Process. Okay, great comment. Other thoughts? No, these are these are more like suggestions to the superintendent. But go ahead. But what if what if you're comfortable with this? What if you're comfortable? Yeah. Okay. Thoughts? So so. Yeah yeah sure sure sure. Go ahead. You got your mic. I don't think the community has had an active role in this process yet. It would be nice because especially if we choose a new model that they feel empowered by it and part of it. I think we could do that if we had more time and didn't try to cram it in over the holidays in November and December. I also think APS is in the process of developing a strategic plan and a theory of change. And it would be nice if that was done and then incorporated into because a lot of the decisions I feel like the superintendent's gonna need to make on which model she's ultimately gonna pick is based on where she feels like all those things are. So that those would be my reasons. Um, I don't think we lose anything now that we have a year, that the state's basically given us, a, everyone, a year. And with our letter well, of intent, we- They didn't quite give us a year. They What they did is, because the date, remember, the date doesn't change. The date doesn't change. So we, so we don't have quite a year. We have like until June. We have until June. Mm -mm. No, we have, our application has to be in by June. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah, so the thing, exactly. So what they said was, you don't, have a, you don't have any extra time from June 30th, 2015. What they said was, we'll give you some interim waivers until your application, and that's what the language says, that your application makes it through the process so that you're not having to worry of, of financial concerns because you're waiting on them to approve your, your application. Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. It's it's rolling. I think it would be the following year, but you have to start to operationalize. I think the pieces of it that you can when it be, when it becomes approved. But you don't have to be. But yeah, 15, 16 is a waived year. <laughs> Meaning like you, you're, you're not going to be held account, you're not held accountable for your, uh, implementa your, your implementation, your targets, that thing. Right. Right. I hear you. Okay. So what I hear is we need more time for application development in the plan given kind of where we're thinking we need in terms of flexibility. So how much time, or do we just map out a plan and say in November and December, we will come up with the, the full scale plan for application development? I think, I think like October is project plan development for how we're gonna do the application. Okay, so her suggestion is October becomes figuring out the timeline for application development. Mm -hmm. 
no, I don't think we, we can't. We have to wait till the board to decide. So that we know that we're voting on, I mean, that we're developing work supporting whatever they're voting on. So I don't think we would know until November. Model. Model, flexibility model, and then you know, then all the other things that are associated. I think the student board and the school system will work those things out. And I agree. I don't think we should get into trying to figure out what the timeline should be. Okay. I, I mean, I like. I think that the suggestion maybe is just that once we have a vote and a letter of intent, that we come up with a project plan. But okay. With extensive community engagement. Like so once we have. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna rewrite, I'm gonna rewrite the language. I'm gonna take it out. What'd you say? I'm gonna bring the mic to you. <laughs> say that. APS historically has a track record of not making hard decisions for our board, so I'm always worried about pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off, you never make a decision. I mean, if you just say that the board acted really quickly in November and chose a model, um, that there's been all these discussions going on, you're really talking about an effective implementation 20 months later. Um, so then it gives you a good bit of time to get your local school governance model um, created because you get a free calendar year. So it's 20 months. Mm -hmm. Just make a recommendation on the model. So, so I can make the language a little bit more general to just to say that a key consideration needs to be the application development process and, and to drive community input time, okay. Okay, so we will adjust the last page, and I will adjust, um, so I, I will remove the slides that are on the back side. One is a timeline slide. The thing that's in purple is kind of like application development. I had question mark, question mark, because I didn't know. Um, but what I'll just, we'll just put in words and in writing around, you know, that the system select a model and determine and, and ensure that um, there is consideration for the um, application development and to ensure community input as a part of that process. And then I'll just remove, because um, it's working draft, working draft. Um, the slides in the back so that we will end in terms of the proposed recommendation, recommended action from the committee. Okay. Okay, I wanna go backwards just to highlight some slides and you can tell me, these are for your consideration. 
Um, I'm gonna go backwards to page 19 and I wanna pass out some papers. So the question was, what waivers might, 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 might we use? Um, here is some suggestions based off of, this is an exemplar, an example, not the list, but <clears throat> given some of the conversations around, um, this is just a general list of possible, of possible, um, so what you'll see as soon as it comes around, you'll see the big four buckets that are helping to outline the strategic plan. The academic program, talent strategy, systems, resources, and culture. And on the left side is kind of the priority challenge, and on the right side is the related flexibility waiver. Um, some are bucketed in short term or long term, but these are just examples of how we might use flexibility, given that you all said that we, you think that we might need to use flexibility. Here are some examples of how we might use flexibility. Um, and Rebecca, um, and Carolyn helped to kind of <clears throat> cull this information. I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to share, if there's some, some examples you want to share. So um, we looked through uh, the feedback that we got from principals mostly about um, the challenges that they're facing that they want the system to address and looked at what some other districts are doing in those areas related to the four kind of strategic priorities that are in our current logic model. Um, one of the big ones was um, some of the specific program requirements from the State Board of Education. So thinking about um, new ways, because we have so many students that are performing be below grade level, new ways of doing um, the early intervention program and remedial education programs, which are um, programs that we get additional funding for, but which have kind of a prescriptive set of models for how we deliver that instruction. Um, so we heard from schools that, um, that they might like to reimagine the way that they do that for our students because we have so many kids who fall in those buckets. Um, another related one is gifted and talented, that we have some schools that have so many kids that fall in those buckets that thinking about a different way of pro providing gifted, aside from the four, I think, models that the state allows um, might be good for our kids. Uh, my friend David Payne and I were sitting here recently just talking about um, the impact that zero tolerance laws have on some of our disproportionality and forcing us to put kids in alternative school who probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, and that um, looking at different ways to differentiate uh, disciplinary consequences um, would be good for all of our kids and especially for the places that we see disproportionality in impacts, um, particularly with special education and students of color. Um, we saw other districts using uh, waivers of graduation requirements to um, address academic deficiencies with like student athletes to kind of make up more time in their schedules to provide more academic instruction. Um, a lot of places they're using seat time waivers to provide scheduling flexibility. Um, in the, kind of the bucket of longer term solutions, we were, as we were kind of looking at those three areas where we were aligning decision making to the most logical level for that to happen, um, we could think about clusters being allowed to design their own pathways um, to support that signature programming. So to waive the state allowed courses to say Maynard Jackson wanted to have an urban agriculture pathway and it, um, Stephanie Johnson could create her own um, set of courses. We'd have to work with the state to develop those but that you can go outside of the prescribed set of courses that the state currently allows. Um, and then you can also use the waivers for certification requirements to hire 
you know, somebody who is a highly qualified farmer <laughs> to teach that agriculture course who might not be a certified teacher. Um, I know a few of those in my neighborhood <laughs> that I can introduce you to, but I think you probably already know them, Stephanie. Um, um, we've also been talking about grading as a really important instructional focus, the way that we give students grades. And right now we have the constraint that um, there's a state law that requires us to give numerical grades to students in grades four through 12. And so if we were thinking about pursuing standards-based grading for older students, um, we would have to, we would be able to use a waiver to do that. Um, and Linda Anderson and I are happy to talk your ear off about standards-based grading after the meeting when Angela's on her way to see Ms. Pope. Mm -hmm. um, under talent strategy, some things we were talking about, we saw this year at the beginning of the year that most of our vacancies that, we, that still existed at the beginning of school were related to hard to staff areas like, um, it, like fine arts, um, foreign language, science and math, so being able to waive certification requirements Your bike went out. Probably. Where's the other? Um. <laughs> we um, heard from Fulton that they used a waiver to give their principals the ability to relatively immediately re remove new teachers who were just not working out. Um, so that they didn't have to keep an ineffective new person in place for the whole year. Um, we've seen other schools and districts using waivers for school day and seat time um, and school year to provide more time for professional development for their teachers. Um, and then uh, sort of longer term strategies would be thinking about things like um, retaining effective teachers by building career ladders inside the classroom. Um, these are ideas that there's extensive research happening in other um, other districts and states and has been for some time. Um, thinking about ways that we could influence experienced effective teachers to teach in higher need schools and with our more challenging populations. Um, so one thing that I think is really cool that Fulton is doing, they, no they noticed that they um, really needed more teachers that were qualified in certain high need areas like ESOL and special education. So they are currently waiving the salary schedules so that instead of people getting paid more because they get any miscellaneous master's degree, they're taking the, that money and doing targeted tuition reimbursement to pay for those degrees in the areas that they need for the people and then provide, so they pay for the degree and then providing bonuses um, based on them going into the field and, and teaching the, in the area that they need people to go into. Um, you could also do something like that with waiving salary schedules to think about things like paying the you know, Georgia Tech engineering grad more than the new physical education teacher grad or the English major. Um, I was a women's studies major, so I can't really say that that um, is a personally driven <laughs> Uh, desire, but you know, when you look at the kind of average um, entering starting salaries for people with different kinds of degrees, that we might be able to start to be a little more competitive with our brand new graduates um, if we did something like that. Um, and then we've also thought about ways that we could do class size in smarter ways. Um, so instead of just sort of blanket lowering class size or raising class size to um, use our money in a smarter ways to get more students in front of our most effective teachers. Um, under systems and resources, this one was a little more challenging to, <laughs> to think about ways that we might use flexibility. Um, we've definitely heard over and over again from probably every principal in the district that schools need more flexibility to match their staffing structures with the needs of their student body. So waiving staffing requirements to say, you know, put another mathematics specialist in the building instead of an assistant principal or, you know, whatever other um, position the school might have. Um, students needing additional behavior supports 
you can use class size waivers or staffing waivers to direct resources toward you know behavior specialists or something like that um, creating new kinds of positions um, you know you could even create positions like we used to have school administrative managers in some schools that were really helpful at having our principals focus on instruction because that person took a lot of the routine day-to-day -day, like enrolling kids in school fussing with the data systems and stuff like that off of their plates um, we already this year are using a waiver that the state approved to more efficiently combine schools so at Thero we have a waiver um, to only have one principal there's a staffing requirement that every school has to have a principal and we waived that to allow for us to be more agile in the transition so before the three schools get formally and legally combined into one school they they currently are under the leadership of one principal Longer term, you know, I think that we would likely see that some of the um, central office functions that are really focused on compliance um, might be able to be reduced in favor of um, directing those resources into um, schools and instruction. Uh, you know, all of that's not going to go away because Title I still is what it is, um, but some of the compliance functions may hopefully be reduced. Yes, Alan. Well, I want to make a comment that's not it's tangential, but related. Can you let it go into the microphone? I will um, repeat what you say that other I'm people need to hear. Broadcast at a time. So I'm glad you were very specific because I just want to make a general comment, sort of a historical comment. I don't know if people know this, but when the Carter Law first came into Georgia in the late 90s, they actually made folks who apply. Mm -hmm. I just say this colors my um, feelings about I squared versus Carter District. So initially, when Carter Law came in, you had to specify which waivers you needed and enumerate them. And what the state board found was that that was limiting. And what happened with the program up front, they had so many folks coming back to them under Carter is because once they had flexibility, they just weren't sure, you know, initially what they were going to need. So that that is, I think, a significant difference. You know, do you have to ask for them all up front? You know, again, the state and the state board came back and changed the whole flexibility. And, and I think that it also, like, our General Assembly meets for 40 days every year, and every year they make new laws about education, and we don't necessarily know what those are going to be in advance. Um, so at the last couple under the culture bucket um, were related to professional learning time. Um, we are, like, for example, we're trying to look for time when our entire employee team can come together and um, it's really hard for us to find that time in our schedule so we could use um, school year or school day waivers to provide additional time for that professional learning for all staff um, and sort of thinking about like how to create a performance culture that rewards effective employees and instructional staff using um, salary schedule waivers to create those career pathways, maybe thinking about more leader development um, and rewarding effective staff by kind of redirecting the way that that money is being spent. Anybody have any questions or other ideas? And I'm so sorry, I thought you were done. That's why I watched your slides. I'm used to it, Alan. <laughs> no, but I wanted to, because th there, was a, there, were, there were some questions on so how could we really use this? Like, what would you do with it? And what types of waivers might you look at? Um, so this was just an exemplar. It's not the thing. It's not what APS is going to use. But wanted to kind of give you some examples given you know, um, some of our previous conversations. OK, we're almost there. So if you'll turn, to, turn over to slide 20, page 20, I mean, <clears throat> this is a what if APS was an IE squared system. And so this is the analysis from last week um, from Ruby's team in terms of, remember, they made the change for IE squared to be a flat. You need to have that flat 3% growth across all schools. And so we wanted to ask the question with CCRPI, if APS was an IE squared system and they, we had to meet that 3% target, would we meet, meet it? Now remember, I, this was the first year for CCRPI? Right? Second, second year? Second year? 
It's the first year with the new rules, but the second year, and it's old, it's two years old. So keep that in mind, and this is not a trend, and you really should look at the trend analysis with this, but basically this lets us know that if given the current rules with IE squared, 59% of APS schools would have met that 3% target with CCRPI, and roughly 40% of our schools would not necessarily have made the target. Now, the, I, a question that we had yesterday, Ruby, was um, around the, um, this is without the challenge points, right? And then the, for the schools that are really, have really high CCRPI like a Morningside at 94.3, how could they continue to grow when there's the margin in terms of the space to, to, for to 100 is only you know six or seven points? Are, are they already capped and so they're good? Stay. They would. Right. That was my understanding, and I think it was 85. So for schools. So I didn't know when John did the calculation if he included a school like a Morningside in the 59, because they could just maintain. They don't have to, you know, they're already so high, they don't have to keep. I would need to ask him. You would have to clarify. Okay, so that's a point of clarification. And if, this, if these are overall, um, if these are overall CCRPI results, they do include challenge points. Okay, but again, I mean, because that's the other thing we wouldn't have backed them out. I highly one doubt thing we we looked out. at when you look at what Lou gave us, he said it's without the challenge points. I'd have to jump. So okay, so we definitely I need for you to go back and look at this, um, Ruby, yeah. and and clarify on that in terms of the three percent and the challenge points and whether they're included or not included, because when we looked at Lou's presentation from last week. It did. It said without the challenge points, and it also said for schools that are really high performing and are you know in that top quartile that they just have to maintain. They don't have to keep grow, you know growing with the three percent. And there's like a a base where like if you meet that, then you're good. And so I just want to make sure that schools like a morning site are not included in this, and that our number is real clean. Okay. okay. So then, the, then, so you guys saw that number last week, but um, you all also asked me, well, what if we were a charter system? How would we compare APS's CCRPI with other charter system CCRPI like a Fulton County? So this chart on the bottom of 20 shows all those systems that are currently charter systems, where they are in terms of CCRPI. Yes? If you look at the next slide on the top of page 21, it's actually a visual of it. Mm -hmm. So depending upon which view you like. And the um, bright red is in the rank, rank order, highest to lowest. These are all districts that have already selected charter. You can see where the overall average for the state of Georgia, that's the darker gray. And then the, the red is where we are right now. So we just wanted you to see that. We're not a but we're not a charter system, so it's kind of like. But it is the of, CC, of it's the all of the RPI ones, of all the ones who selected charter system? I just added our graph to that, and yes, we were at the bottom. Yeah, like I mean, I, I, I would look at this and just say what it says is that we are at the, the, the bottom in this com when compared to these other school districts. I don't on this index. I don't know if it speaks to whether or not we're ready for this group or that or that this model versus that model versus this model.
Well, and and also for IE for IE squared, we know what the target is. For a charter system, we set the the target at the district level. So we don't know if we haven't decided whether it's going to be at the state level. We right, and I, I I could be wrong on that, but with charter system, we set our own you, targets in our contract mm, at the system level. You it, it's there's a baseline. baseline. Right. Yeah. There's. But there maybe targets not the right. But there are targets goals aren't the that right are set role. at the um, system, system level, level i.e. squared or school-based targets that as of last week and the are determined. I think they're, I think they're they're very different because, at the for I E squared, it's it's at the individual school level, it's a this three percent thing, um, um, in terms of the CCRPI at the school level, whereas at the charter system level, my understanding is they're going to look at your CCRPI, which is for the system, for the system, and see how you're comparing against other other charter systems and they'll add in the the beating the odds and metrics. they will add so the they, beating the odds. they they put in controls for what they call non malleable factors so poverty um, race So I didn't, I think I forgot, and let me make a big note to myself. Because I had it in here for the priority alert, we already have an accountability process in which the state looks at how the school is performing and they give um, a, a category of priority alert or focus schools. And that's happening right now, even independent of the operating model. And that, that will continue even Independent of the operating model process. Yeah. Okay. I have eight minutes. Yeah. Well, I was just a quick question. So, um, Dr. Sullivan, have you oh, looked at the system? Have you looked at um, the beating the odds, adding that into with our schools and with the data you have? That would push us up on a lot of these measures, right? Okay, and Erica's comment was, what would the school system do when they see that a school isn't performing? How would they go about?
And we can hold it until after scandal. <laughs> okay, so in our six minutes, do we, do we have anybody from the community who signed up? No? We're looking. Okay. Okay, most of you all have smartphones. Kathleen just sent you your survey, your one question survey. So if you will take out your phone, your iPad, your computer, if you don't have a phone or an iPad in the back corner, you can vote. Get on there. It's spinning. Yes. <laughs> oh, maybe because we're all trying, all 30 of us. You can take it in the back if you want. Um, this is for charter system? Yeah. That's the application. Their question. Okay. So Gail just pulled, while you're trying to do your survey, I do want to answer the question um, from Lou's presentation around charter system that they will look at CCRPI, beating the odds, like we said, attendance and parent satisfaction slash participation in, um, as a part of the charter term. Okay, so did you guys get it? Okay, Pam needs some assistance. Oh, I need to reach my, I pushed the wrong button. Are you serious? <laughs> There's a hanging shad. <laughs> he said I pushed the wrong one. Okay, okay. You're gonna have to stay after class. <laughs> You're gonna have to stay after class. Hold on. Oh my goodness. Hold on, hold on, you. Go to Kathleen and she'll help you. That's probably what they're gonna have to do. Okay. So, I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to send you a revised PowerPoint. I'll try and make all the revisions tomorrow by close of 5 o'clock. Um, and Rebecca and Chuck, Rich, I want your PowerPoint. Um, I'm still going to need that. And so let me incorporate that. I'll send it to you. And if you will, like, look at the, the slides that are, I'll try and list the hot button slides that we need to edit. Um, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, and then Monday, I'll send you an invitation in the morning for Monday um, so that you guys can come. I would love for you all to come. Um, I want to thank you again for your tremendous, and I'm going to publicly thank you um, during the October board meeting, but I want to thank you, thank you, thank you for your hard, <laughs> you fixed it. For his dedicate, for dedication. So did everybody in the room, were you able to submit? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. See there, that's teamwork right there. Teamwork makes the dream work. Okay, it is time. I would also like to publicly thank Alan for the chocolate. Thank you, Alan. It's the little things. It's the little things. It's the little things. Okay, thank you guys.